Having laboriously derived the method for describing the geopotential of any arbitrary central body, we are now going to immediately throw away the vast majority of that formalism and focus on the azimuthly symmetric case, and furthermore, only consider the effects of the J2 term, the oblateness term of our central body. We will come back to the full arbitrary description presently, but there's a couple of reasons why it's useful for us to start with this vastly simplified case. First, as we've already seen, the J2 term is dominant for many central bodies and many of the major bodies of our solar system. Because we are leaving ourselves with a much simplified perturbing potential, we are able to get from this formulation relatively simple and analytically tractable differential equations for the time evolution of the various Keplerian orbital elements. And we can then use those as preliminary design tools to create novel orbits that would otherwise be impossible in a pure two-body system. Recall that in the azimuth symmetric case, we have a potential that is a function of the orbital radius magnitude r and the zenith angle or polar angle phi of the orbiting body only. It is independent of the azimuth angle lambda. And the potential is given by the usual central body potential, which is mu over r. And in this case, mu is going to be the gravitational constant times the mass of the central body. So we are furthermore assuming that the mass of the orbiting body is insignificant as compared to the mass of the central body, which is true for all spacecraft, for example. And the perturbing potential in this case is given by a single term, which has the form negative mu over the orbital radius magnitude times the J2 constant, times the equatorial radius of the central body divided by the orbital radius magnitude squared times the first Legendre polynomial in cosine phi, which evaluates to three cosine squared phi minus one over two. A few more preliminary things to set ourselves up. We are going to be using our usual conic section expression for the orbital radius magnitude. And you will note here that we're using the elliptical form of this expression. We are really focused in this analysis on closed orbits. We are interested in treating relatively small perturbations that gradually change the orbit over many orbital periods. When you're dealing with open orbits where the orbiting body interacts with the central body very briefly and in the context of less than a full revolution, the perturbations due to geopotential typically don't have a significant effect. It really takes many orbits for these effects to build up. And so this analysis is really geared towards closed orbits. You will recall that when we derived the general form of the perturbing potential, we placed an emphasis on the fact that we needed to be working in a body fixed frame. For the arbitrary case, in order to capture correctly the azimuthal variations in the, in the geopotential, the spherical coordinates describing the position of the orbiting body with respect to the central body had to be with respect to a reference frame where the unit directions rotate with the body and are fixed to the body. However, in the azimuthally symmetric case, there is no azimuthal variation. This potential is independent of lambda. And so the only thing that's important is for the polar angle for phi to be measured from the polar direction of the body, the direction that is orthogonal to the equator of the body. Because of this, we can operate in an inertial frame, and it just has to be an equatorial frame. And so, for example, if the central body is the Earth, we have to be operating in our Earth centered inertial frame that is an equatorial frame. And so we denote the unit directions by the primed directions to indicate that this is an equatorial frame. If we do this analysis for any other body, we similarly have to be working in an equatorial frame for that body. We are going to take the orbital radius vector, r PRL O, which we will write simply as r, and we will express its components in this I prime frame using our two different sets of coordinates. The first one being the spherical coordinates. And so we've already written down this expression previously and can simply plug into it. We know that the components of the radius vector are given in terms of the spherical components by this matrix here. And we have also similarly previously written the components of the orbital radius in terms of the Euler angles defining the Keplerian element set, that is omega, and capital omega and i and nu. And when we write out that version of the components, we get this matrix here. These two matrices are representing exactly the same thing. Both of these are equivalently the components of the orbital radius in the i prime frame. 
And that means that each row of these two matrices has to be equivalent. And from this, we get a nice constraint expression, namely that cosine of phi has to be equal to sine i sine theta. We are now ready to start our perturbation analysis, and we have a choice of tools. We can either use Gauss's equations or we can use Lagrange's planetary equations. We're going to start with Gauss and then perform the same analysis using Lagrange and compare the results. In order to apply Gauss's equations, we need a perturbing force term and we need for it to be expressed in components of a rotating frame B, where the first unit direction corresponds to the orbital radius direction, the third unit direction is the angular momentum direction of the orbit, and the third e theta direction completes the unit vector triad. We can get a force term from the perturbing potential term by recalling that for conservative forces, the force is negative the gradient of the potential. So we wish to find a specific force that is negative the gradient of some potential v. In this case, we have negative the gradient of our potential u is negative mu over r cubed in the r direction plus the perturbing force. And so the perturbing force will be negative the gradient of our perturbing potential term, which we've previously called u1. And that is how we get to this expression. Our perturbing force is negative the gradient of this term, where we have absorbed the negative sign into the expression. This gradient is shockingly annoying to evaluate directly in B-frame uh, components. So instead, we are going to introduce yet another frame, a specialized spherical frame that will help us evaluate this gradient, and which is relatively easy to transform into these, this B-frame once we're done. So our spherical frame will be composed of a r-hat direction, which is the same as the er-hat direction of the B-frame, a phi hat direction, which is tangential to the great circle arc connecting the E1 prime, E2 prime plane to point P, and the lambda hat direction, which is orthogonal to both of these. And we are going to explicitly order these as R hat, phi hat, lambda hat. Note that this ordering is not the same ordering as we've previously used for a spherical frame. However, it doesn't matter. We can circularly permute any frame ordering, and as long as we retain the right-hand rule properties of the frame, such that the cross products all work out as they should, it really doesn't matter. This is just for bookkeeping and to make our lives easier in the final transformation. Using this frame definition, we can write down the spherical coordinate version of our gradient, the partial of the perturbing potential with respect to r in the r-hat direction, plus 1 over r times the partial of the perturbing potential with respect to phi in the phi-hat direction, plus 1 over r sine phi times the partial of the perturbing potential with respect to lambda in the lambda-hat direction. But in this case, there is no lambda dependence in the perturbation, and so this term is strictly 0. We evaluate these two terms and can then write down this expression for the components of the perturbing force in the S-frame. In order to get the perturbing force vector into components of the B-frame, we need to define the direction cosine matrix relating the S and B-frames. Since these two frames share the same first unit direction, that is, since E hat R is the same as R hat, we know that this direction cosine matrix will be given by a rotation about this unit direction. And using the same bit of spherical trigonometry that we used in our original derivation of Lagrange's planetary equations, we can find that the angle of rotation is given by pi over 2 minus the arc tangent of cosine theta times the tangent of the inclination. So we form the direction cosine matrix that is the rotation by this angle about that first unit direction of both frames. We apply it to this matrix. We make the substitution that we previously found that cosine phi is equal to sine i sine theta, and we end up with this form of the perturbing force in components of the B-frame. You will note that the perturbing force in this case has non-zero components in each of the three unit directions of the B-frame, and recalling the form of Gauss's perturbation equations, this tells us that we will have non-zero derivatives for all of the Keplerian orbital elements. 